You may have asked or heard these questions. Why do scientists say that the Earth was created over billions of years? Why are there fossils of these things called dinosaurs? Or fossils that show changes in species over time? Are scientists lying or is the Bible lying? Because it speaks of none of those things in the Bible. It doesn't have a T-Rex chapter in there, right? <laughs> and so we ask, how can these things be reconciled if they can? And so today we look at that piece and making sense of the Bible of uh, religion and scripture. One of my favorite classes in college was a course called, in undergrad, uh, Dialogues Between Science and Religion. Um, I was a religion major, and yet I loved science, biology, that is. Um, I took the regular biology course, and then I took a course on human genetics, which was like the next the upper biology course, and I loved it. Um, again, the biology, because like chemistry to me sounds too much like math, and I don't even want to like think about it. There were forums um, in, the, in temples, in the area of Lakeland, and in churches uh, that united different religions, religious groups, and scientists to discuss different topics, um, to discuss them civilly. But the big one back then was stem cell research. And I remember whenever I would saw that there was going to be a talk about stem cell research, I, would, I ate that stuff up. So just when you thought I couldn't get any nerdier, <laughs> no. That I actually really like science too. Um, in that di dialogues class, um, we talked about four different possibilities regarding these two subjects, specifically in E.N.G. Barber's book *When Science Meets Religion*, which I have up here in case anyone wants to look at it later. This was actually one of my textbooks, which I kept. Um, and he has four different approaches to this, or possibilities. There's conflict meaning that there's conflict between science and religion. They cannot coexist at all. They just, they conflict. There's independence where they can exist, but completely separate. There's nothing that either one can glean from the other. And then there's dialogue and integration, which are various varying forms of, of dialogue, some which um, give more permission uh, than the other, or, or acknowledge the other more than the other, but, in different ways. So those second two are kind of the happier, nicer um, aspects of it. You may find yourself, you have already identified with one of these groups, or you may have, or you have further questions, or stories you remember from history, like Galileo. I remember we talked about Galileo observing that the sun um, did not orbit the earth, but that the earth orbited the sun. And then the church freaked out because it's all about us, and everything revolved around the earth. And so they kicked him out. They put, imprisoned him and kicked him out. Um, you might remember that from history. So there's then this tension. Um, but we find ourselves in a place where technology and science, we've learned things that never before in history we've done, right? We have the ability to look at cells on a very cellular level, right? We've discovered these fossils. We know more about um, how our bodies work and all of those things. And so at the same time, we then have to look at, and what does the Bible say about this? What does God say about this? And it typically comes back down to how we interpret scripture, right? That's kind of what we've been talking about all of these weeks, our interpretation. Um, so my hope is that the remaining weeks is to look at these challenging issues and see how our biblical inter interpretation can make sense of them, if it can. The creation narrative is one that is part of that big deal uh, with the science. Literal days of creation, seven, or there's the contextual, meaningful prose expressing God's heart in our humanity, and then there's stuff in between. There's the idea maybe dinosaurs existed, but they didn't seem to coexist with humans, so no, they wouldn't be on the ark. I think I've alluded a couple times, even probably in how I phrased the options that I do lean in a certain direction, right? And so we're gonna look at specifically, instead of continuing to look at just details of science and religion, let us look at what it looks like to interpret a scripture. To interpret Noah, acknowledging that science is valuable and has factual evidences and that it's good. 
um, but that scripture is also valuable and that God speaks to us through it. Um, kind of going with one of the stories of Genesis is that flood story. We talk about um, how, did, how does that make sense? Could that amount of animals actually be inside of the ark? Wouldn't they eat each other? Wouldn't they be too heavy? How would they possibly fit? Makes no sense if we're thinking of it, you know, scientifically. And this story has made news in the past couple months. Did anyone see the movie Noah? Who saw the movie? Did you not watch it because you heard bad things about it? Or what did you? Okay, now I'm a little nervous. Hold on, I'm sweating. Um, okay, so I saw it. And I actually really liked it. <gasps> now, the movie was not an American evangelical Christian movie. Okay? It was heavy, Jewish inspired, um, heavily. It had that ancient lit feel with an influence from the Midrash, the Midrash and Jewish mysticism. And then it also had some like legit Hollywood craziness in it. Um, so there were liberties that were taken. But for what it was worth, a movie as someone who enjoys and likes movies, um, I liked it. It was intense and a lot of people, again, didn't like it. I actually found myself at one point, I was in the theater by myself, though there was actually Trinity people behind me, um, so I technically wasn't by myself. But um, I found myself at one point out loud by myself saying, oh my god, no. Like, <laughs> like it was really intense. Um, but I like those kinds of movies, so it was, it was good. But what I liked about it mostly was that it kind of got us talking, right? It got us talking about what does this story mean? How do we interpret scripture? Now, I didn't actually see good dialogue that happened, but I hope and assume that somewhere in the earth, people actually dialogue as opposed to just screamed at each other uh, for that. And I tried to do selected verses without reading three chapters, and I didn't realize how long it actually was till I just saw this printout from John. But we're gonna look at selected pieces of the story. So try to imagine yourself and transport yourself in the story from Genesis, different verses. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. But Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord. Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you alone are righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and its mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and its mate, and seven pair of the birds of the air, also male and female, to keep their kind alive on the face of all the earth. For in seven days I will send rain on the earth for forty days and forty nights, and every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. The flood continued 40 days on the earth, and the waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters swelled and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. The waters swelled so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters swelled above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep, and all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, domestic animals, wild animals, all swarming creatures that swam on the earth, and all human beings. Everything on dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life. But God remembered Noah, and all the wild animals, and all the domestic animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth, and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. The rain from the heavens was restrained, and the waters gradually receded from the earth. And the end of 150 days, the waters had abated. And in the seventh month of the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. 
The waters continued to abate until the 10th month, and the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains appeared. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as come out of the ark, I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And then after that, it says, I will give you a sign, right? And it is the rainbow. Now, the context of this story, which goes from chapter 6 through 9, is one of the world that saw the earth as three-tiered. I don't know if you notice, it says the windows of heaven and how the water came out from the bottom, too. It was not the sphere, right? It was literally three layers, three levels, and stuff came down or stuff came up. And God was up here and hell was down here. That was how things were viewed. So that's kind of the context of how this story is viewed, how creation even, the creation story is viewed. The globe didn't exist, heavens opened up. And they were also in the midst of a culture that was a polytheistic culture. There was many gods, not one god. People didn't worship one god, they worshiped several gods. And there were several flood stories. Um, in this Mesopotamian area, there's one that we'll look at specifically, but there was flood stories. And Adam Hamilton, in his Making Sense of the Bible book, goes in one of the chapters, talks about why possibly they even talked about floods. Um, I'm not going to get into that specifically, but it's in the book if you want to look at it. But the region of Mesopotamia, where our biblical authors were, had several flood stories. Um, and I'm going to take a look at how the Hebrew Bible... The Hebrew flood story is distinct from those other stories. In our polytheistic story, we find several gods in the story, some greater than others. Um, this is a brief overview, but the main god had become annoyed of the humans down below because they had multiplied way too much and they were being too loud. They were causing a lot of ruckus and this god, his beauty sleep was interrupted. He was sleeping, and the noise woke him up, and he was not happy. Now, we go to the Hebrew Bible, and the very first verses that we looked at. And the Lord was sorry that he made, well, it says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually, and it grieved him to his heart. We have the polytheistic gods who get annoyed, and you are in annoyance. And then we have the Hebrew god that his heart is grieved, who sees violence and war and people oppressing each other. And his heart breaks, and he is sorry. That's one of the first big distinctions of how the Hebrew god is different. Um, the Hebrew god, in the, our polytheistic story, the god decides to destroy the earth and to save only the hero of the story, um, but punished everyone equally, but he didn't examine everyone. In the Hebrew Bible, we see that God examined folks' heart, and he couldn't find anyone whose heart was pure. Everyone was evil. And that's actually one of the good visuals of the movie Noah. It shows, like, the world gone awry, like, even, like, worse than now. Like, no one. You could find no good person in there. Um, and so God looked for that, he valued that, whereas the polytheistic God was like, I don't care if anyone's good or not. I'm just annoyed, so you're all going to die, is what happens. Um, the hero in the polytheistic story was simply the main God's favorite. There was favoritism there. He wasn't found to be righteous or humble. He just happened to be the teacher's pet, and so he's the one who got saved. Hebrew Bible, what happened? Noah was found righteous before God. He was good. His heart was good. And so that's why he was selected. And the fourth main cause of their or, or difference, though there are several other smaller differences, is the conclusion. And this is my favorite part. Um, 
in the polytheistic story, the conclusion is, okay, so this is not gonna happen again. I am just, the God is not gonna allow the people to multiply as they had. There's gonna be like a cap, there's gonna be a limit. This is not gonna happen again. It won't be allowed. In the Hebrew Bible, Yahweh establishes a covenant. That's a big deal. Um, that's part of the language of the time, right? Remember, we talk about how the Bible is a messy book for messy people. A language written for us so that we can understand it in the best way possible. Covenant was an important idea for those folks. Uh, Yahweh establishes a covenant. Covenants were a big deal. A covenant being a saving relationship. God establishes a covenant which says, I will never do this again. See the rainbow in the clouds. And we know now that a rainbow is actually blue, right? The light reflect. But still, so science, and still it's a sign of a remembrance. I will never let anger or retribution rule. I will stick in here with you, though you fail. I will be your loving, long-suffering God. But then he does this, I do however want what is good for you, and I want to protect you. And so then what God does, and we don't see it, but you can look at it in chapter 9 later, he establishes rules. You will not be violent to one another. You will not hurt one another. I am giving you responsibilities for the earth. You will be fruitful and multiply. It's that kind of the, again, that creation gone awry, the things that weren't supposed to happen that happened. All right, let's, let's start over. This is what I want. This is what is good. This is what will be helpful, not hurting one another. So you see the story of the flood is not typically, we can, interpreting it this way, we can see that it's not to teach us about ancient history, but it is first and foremost a story about God. God is the main character and what is in God's heart specifically. We get like an insight into the heart of God, where it says that his heart is grieved what God values and what God is, uh, is what we learn in the story. We also see the stories about ourselves, about our brokenness, about the earth, and about the relationship between all of those things. I taught confirmation this past Sunday, and they're in week two, I think, and they were talking about sin. So we read the creation story, specifically where Adam and Eve, there was the serpent and um, that whole story, and I, I asked at one point, who sinned here? First hand was like Eve, and I was like, who else? It wasn't just Eve. <laughs> Let's not blame the woman. No, I'm kidding. Um, it was all of them, right? It was a broken, and, and what relationships were broken is what I asked them later. Well, the relationship between humans and God was broken. There was a relationship broken between Adam and Eve, between people, and there was actually a relationship broken between nature and humans, right? You will have to till the earth. The serpent will bite you on the ankle, like all of those things. There was broken relationships all around in that story. And that is what sin happened. And so we uh, later then drew, like, they had done the creation story and had drawn things. And I said, how has sin affected those? So if they had drawn the ocean, how has sin affected the ocean? Have you heard of oil spills? Have you heard of doing damage to the... All of those things are results of our broken relationships with God, with each other, and with creation. And the story of Noah actually speaks of all of those things. The Bible is about revealing God's self to us, about helping us ha see how to live in ways that are helpful for us. And then there's more, then there are those more confusing pieces which... I probably will get to eventually where I will, might just stand up here and be like, oh no, y'all. But um, we're not there yet. Um, and so I ask, as I typically do in these questions, but I ask you to meditate on these questions and ask them for yourselves. And saying all that I've said and understanding then how this speaks about God and about, let me just say, the, this God made a relationship, a covenant rather, with nature as well. That's a big deal. Um, the covenant was with people, with nature. I won't let this happen to the animals either. All about God's character. But so the question is, do you think this story speaks to us today? Do any of you resonate with God's grieving heart over violence, hatred, and oppression? When I read that piece, I thought to myself, I can see that. Our hearts are grieved, and I, I imagine God's heart is grieved every day um, in seeing all of the things that happen in the world. 
um, and seeing uh, the violence and hatred. But then what does God have to say about those things? What does God have to say about violence and hatred? And so then what, what should our response be to those things? What does God have to say about how we treat each other? What does God have to say about the responsibility God has given us toward nature and toward all of those relationships that have been broken and that God, since the beginning, has been seeking to restore and to redeem? So what is our responsibility in all of that? And those are, I mean, those are questions that have got me thinking, and I'll probably keep thinking uh, about them through this week, and I do invite you to continue thinking and wrestling. And I don't know if any of you had heard of a similar interpretation of this, or if you're like, oh my gosh, what just happened? Um, but this is a story we do learn in, in Bible school, right? A story that I, I find it kind of ironic that we teach the children because it's kind of a violent story, right? It's like, and then God killed everyone. Here's a sticker. It's like, it's kind of weird, I think. Uh, but when we really look at it, it's a very profound story that has spoken to me um, deeply about our relationships. Um, so let's pray. God, we thank you for your word and for how it is a living word that speaks to us even this day in a different context and different experiences, yet very similar experiences. Um, we are very similar, and that word does speak to us. And God, I pray that that it speaks to each and every one of us, that you um, continue to arise these questions in our hearts, um, that you continue to give us a spirit of inquiry, of digging deep, even when it's uncomfortable, even when we're uncertain, of wrestling with these things so that we can discover anew and in more deep and profound ways um, how you reveal yourself to us. God, thank you for the space, the safe space to share um, and to struggle. Um, and we praise you and and. Give you thanks. In Jesus' name. Amen.